studios. Uh, I was blissfully unaware of all this because I was uh, working as a contributing producer on a mammoth documentary series about uh, the Second World War entitled The World at War. Um, but then I did rec receive a phone call from Lloyd Shirley who was running the creative side of Euston as well as being head of drama at Thames and he said he was looking for a film producer and a film drama producer and was I interested and of course um, I said well I know nothing about actors and uh, screenwriting and related matters but he said you do know a lot about 16 mil film on location. Anyway I said I would think about it and I went schlepping off around the world to interview admirals and generals and retired politicians who'd survived World War II. And, but when I got back, um, Lloyd called me again and he said the producer of the Special Branch couldn't do it anymore and would I like to take over. And I swallowed very hard, but my then boss, Jeremy Isaacs, generously released me from my World War contract and I began a new life. It was a steep learning curve, but I survived. And then Lloyd, Shirley and George Shade asked me if we'd like to do another series. Now, it was about that time we were dubbing the final episode of Special Branch. You all know what dubbing involves, yes? Sound dubbing, you know, getting all the sound together, putting it on the track. And we did that in a dubbing theatre in Soho in, in London, um, where most of the dubbing theatres are. And we finished the dub early. Um, we went to the Pizza Express, which was the only Pizza Express in those days. Had a few drinks, it was raining, and we decided to go to the pictures. And we went to the London Pavilion to see the French Connection, which some of you may know he's a film with Gene Hackman and Roy Schneider and, it, and they play New York detectives who undertake a bud, drug bust and it, it's full of action, car chases, shootouts. And it's set in the bleak midwinter on the streets of the Big Apple. We went to the pub afterwards and we got rather excited thinking about wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do those sort of films. Then, as it happened, Lloyd Shirley, um, as head of creative head of Houston had commissioned from a television writer called Ian Kennedy Martin a screenplay featuring a detective in the London Metropolitan Police's C8 department which is a specialised CID unit based in Scotland Yard um, generally known as the Flying Squad it had a, a glamorous reputation for apprehending robbers and other people who might commit major crimes. They, they had high performance cars and they sped around operating at will anywhere in the Metropolitan Police District. Uh, more colloquially, the, the criminal fraternity and others referred uh, to this outfit as the Sweeney, as in Sweeney Todd. I think Ian's original script was entitled McCready, but we did decide to change it to Jack Regan. But Ian's research indicated there was a lot of dissatisfaction amongst the rank and file detectives um, because they were upset about the managerial changes in the Met that were being implemented by the establishment at that time. Uh, the view was that uh, the Metropolitan Police had become organisationally arthritic. Now the London Police Service, the largest force in the country, had had a long uh, history of management problems. Some might argue it still has them. Uh, there were a lot of accusations of graft and corruption rife in the early 70s. Uh, and there have been a number of high profile trials of senior officers convicted of serious malpractice. A new commissioner had to be appointed and the then Home Secretary Ray, Roy Jenkins selected Robert Mark for this role. Now Mark was a bright younger man who'd been the successfully the Chief Constable of Leicestershire. And Mark's brief was to bring the Met kicking and screaming into the 20th or mid-20th century in terms of its management and its use of new technology and the like. Uh, now if that task wasn't difficult enough, it was aggravated by the fact that for the first time, uh, the head of the uh, London's finest would be somebody who'd never been a policeman in the Metropolitan Police. And of course this got up a lot of noses. Uh, particularly within the firm within a firm, which is what the elite detective units of Scotland Yard would call. Um, now, McCready, who became uh, Regan, was to be a maverick flying squad detective, a good thief taker, as they say, but a cop who lived by his own rules and resented the prospect of interfering and meddling new management structure. I was asked to produce the film of Ian's script, um, and it was going to be called Regan, oddly enough and it was in effect a pilot for a new drama series. I mean I leapt at the idea, I can see how all the techniques that uh, we've been developing at Special Branch 
uh, could be employed to um, produce a highly cinematic series, strong on pace and action. And uh, sadly, Ian Kennedy Martin did not enthuse about these changes I wanted to make to his script to ensure a more filmic interpretation of the test. I wanted more sequences on the streets and in cars, and shorter dialogue scenes, more action, more pace and excitement, and I wanted as much of it as possible shot outside uh, on the streets of London. With hindsight, I was possibly a bit too arrogant in articulating my demands. Um, I would argue even now that I wasn't seeking to undermine Ian's role as the creator, merely to exploit the cinematic capacity. Um, I was convinced a Houston Films production could achieve. I suspect Ian believed he was going to be in charge and the notion that he would have to answer to a very Tyro drama producer who was more used to running up the Falls Road in a flak jacket than dealing with actors and writers and um, all the arty crafty stuff of drama. Ian had a very good track record in studio-based drama and had worked with a lot of eminent producers. Uh, I don't really think he was opposed to writing for film. I think, understandably, he wanted to play to his perceived strengths. He preferred long playing scenes, in-depth interviews, character development through dialogue, the kind of drama which had been the mainstay, really, of um, television drama since its exception. We quarrelled, it became a me or him situation, uh, the executive producers backed me and um, Ian stalked off and said he didn't want to participate in the series. Um, although Ian's departure gave me a free hand, I'm, I you know, was keen to recognise that it was his idea. More importantly, he brought to the production John Thor, who he'd worked with when he was script editor on an earlier ATV series called Red Cat, which was about a military policeman. Uh, and Ian had also extracted an undertaking from his brother Troy to write at least three scripts. Now, uh, Troy Kennedy Martin was, as some of you may know, Roger knows, um, one of the contributing writers to Z Cars, which was really the first major breakthrough in British television and the depiction of, of police work. Uh, but He's remembered, I suppose, particularly for the Italian job and Kelly's Heroes. The, these were two films he wrote, and then, of course, he went on to do great things like Edge of Darkness and uh, many other um, very good film drama. Now, there's an old and, I think, very pertinent theatrical adage, if you ain't on the page, you ain't on the stage. And it was clear to me if we were going to make 13 films very quickly, and that was the requirement, I needed more writers. Um, the way the production schedule worked, we had to feed a script into the moors of the system every fortnight. Um, and I needed writers who you know, responded to what I was trying to do and, and found the idea of a cinematic style appealing. Um, at the same time, of course, character development is important and that's what makes television really work, uh, as I'm sure you all know. You, know. you get to like and know the characters and wonder what happens to them. Fortunately, there were, there were a lot of writers and directors, uh, and actors for that matter, who, who came in. Um, I, mean, I was also very keen on wit and warmth. Uh, again, I'm sure you all know, uh, people who work in the emergency, uh, emergency services, particularly the police, you know, they have a sort of gallows humour, and that's how they cope with all the angst and trauma that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if you get that right, audiences do respond to it. And um, in addition to Troy, I had the good fortune to engage Trevor Preston, Roger Marshall, later Ranald Graham, and then as the series developed across four series of, of 13 episodes, other writers. Similarly with directors, Tom Clegg, who's still working, he directs the, the Sharp films. He, he, he did the pilot and he did some special branch and I got him and another man called Douglas Canfield who was very good on film, David Wicks, there was a guy called Bill Brain who was a Canadian who'd switched from being a documentary film cameraman to a drama director and he, he too had the right credentials. I thought it might be a good idea to get people from who made TV commercials and that was at a time when you know TV commercials was the big thing filmically and uh, there were people like Terry Green and Sid Robeson who, who came on board. I, I felt that you know if you tell a, 
as they had to tell a, a story interestingly and excitingly in 30 seconds they were the kind of people we needed um, as I said, the production economics were tough. We, we had to make a 13-part series for £450,000. Now, that sounds a lot, but um, that's less than the average cost of a single episode of television drama today. Um, and directors particularly had a hard time. We, we hired them for six weeks. They did two weeks prep, two weeks shooting, and they got had two weeks to get to a fine cut in the cutting room. Then they could turn up and get involved in the dub and so on, but they could only do it if they um, didn't want any money. Now, film historians and others, I mean, they tend to look back at, on Houston films as, you know, through rather rose-tinted spectacles at, uh, you know, as, a, as a creative cornerstone of British television. And it's true the company became rather grander after I left, and under Verity Lambert, uh, it made some very excellent films and series. However, I think, to be honest, Thames Television, the owners, um, the raison d'etre of the film subsidiary for them was, was economic rather than artistic. Um, the film industry was um, on its last legs. I mean, that's the old film industry, the big studios, and um, uh, they were, um, you know, there was, there was labor around. They were used to working freelance, um, casualized. There were no, very few of any regular jobs. Um, Groups that emerged to provide equipment on hire, to build sets, to do all those kind of things, provide catering trucks and dining buses. and um, So you could get rid of the massive overhead that running a television studio involved and just um, you know, pay what you wanted when you wanted it. And it was a very cheap way of, of making television and television drama. And it, you know, in fact, it was a rather good way, I thought. Also, with the talent agreements now, um, although they were the same unions, the unions looking after television um, talent, writers, um, musicians, uh, actors, uh, they'd negotiated very good deals within ITV and BBC. I mean, BBC was, a, as it is now, effectively a state organisation. ITV was very profitable and, uh, of course, a bit, it was a bit like the old Fleet Street days. Um, no management of a television, commercial television company wanted to lose advertising revenue. Um, so invariably they paid when there was a dispute, which resulted in um, what Mrs. Thatcher came to describe as the last bastion of restrictive practice. Now, as I say, although it was the same union, people working in cinema film had no bargaining power. So they, they went for what were called buyouts. So you know, this is how Lou Gray did very well with the shows he made you got an actor or a writer and you paid them a sum of money